Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ramaska Film Podcast Passover Special, Part 1. So, I know that I have not put out an episode in a while, but obviously life can happen. Um, Things have been going on with the pandemic. Uh, Thankfully, things seem to be getting better, even though cases are ticking up. But I was able to get some recording equipment, so hopefully this sounds much better than it did before. And I will continue to work on making these sound better and putting out the best possible product that I can. But in the meantime, I wanted to let everyone know that I wanted to do a two-part Passover special. Um, It's really only two parts because I haven't yet watched all the rest of the movies and shows that I really wanted to and needed to watch. So this part one, I was able to watch the Rugrats Passover special, which should be a big uh, nostalgia trip for anybody who grew up on uh, 90s Nickelodeon, such as myself, and I also watched the uh, 2014 Ridley Scott Exodus Gods and Kings, which I know is much maligned. Um, Ridley Scott has been pretty hit or miss ever since I think his career started. He gets a lot of praise for Alien and Gladiator and the director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven, which I have actually not seen, but everyone keeps telling me I need to. And he gets a lot of flack for pretty much everything else. Oh, I guess he gets praise for Blade Runner, depending on who you talk to. Um, In nerd circles, that's a pretty popular movie. Otherwise, among the general public, I know plenty of people who have sat through it after being told, this is really great, you have to watch it, you have to watch it, this is so good, this is so good. And they just don't understand what all of the hype is about, and they just can't get on board. But um, I watched Exodus Gods and Kings maybe a couple years ago, um, and I actually really enjoyed it. I I thought it was fun. Uh, It's a little boring, a little slow at parts, but I like Christian Bale. I think uh, the choices that Joel Edgerton makes in the film are actually really good choices. I know there was a lot of controversy with whitewashing, with um, uh, the casting and the ancient Egyptian casting, but I think that it's a good sword and sandal film, and... Uh, overall a fun adaptation of the Exodus uh, Moses story but I don't want to get ahead of myself so um, this is part one and then part uh, unfortunately these might come out after Passover but um, please please forgive me part two I was planning to go back and actually sit down and watch the 1954 Charlton Heston Ten Commandments that is a um, a staple of film history as well as the Simpsons Bible Stories, which is the 18th episode of the 10th Simpsons season. If you can believe it or not, that means it came out April 4th, Easter Sunday, on 1999. Um, Actually, I think Easter is on April Sunday, April 4th this year as well, which is absolutely crazy. Um, Coincidence, uh, this episode has a couple different Bible stories in it, but it does contain one where Springfield Elementary School students are Hebrew slaves in ancient Egypt, and Lisa has to guide them to freedom. So that should be fun in episode two. But back to right now, I wanted to talk about the Rugrats Passover special. So um, yeah, the title is simply just called Passover, and it is the season three finale of Rugrats. Um, for those of you who remember, there was also a Rugrats Hanukkah special, because um, the main character, oh my goodness, I'm so blanking right now, I sincerely apologize, Um, Tommy's parents, uh, I believe his mother is Jewish and his father is not. So they go over to um, his uh, grandmother's house and grandfather's house, maternal side, for Passover Seder. But the um, original air date was on April 13th, 1995. And the brief synopsis is, after accidentally locking himself in the attic with the Rugrats, Boris begins to recount the story of Passover. As he does, Angelica imagines herself as the Pharaoh of Egypt, Tommy as Moses, and the rest of the babies as the children of Israel. So, as I said, um, the episode is pretty, I mean, these these were all like 20, 25 minute episodes. Um, but this one does stand out as I, I grew up with a lot of, um, Jewish culture around me, but it was really, really nice to see 
um, these kind of Rugrats specials and popular culture and in the mainstream zeitgeist that really represented a lot of this culture. Um, so Tommy and Angelica are on their way to celebrate Passover at the grandparents' house, um, who are very, very much Russian, uh, Boris and Minka. And the whole time, Angelica's mom is um, really leaning into the working mom, working power woman stereotype, which is um, pretty fun, actually. It's, it's a little overwrought now, but she's on the phone with, like, Middle Eastern royalty, and she's trying to wheel and deal and make all kinds of business deals and stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty fun. It, it's pretty fun. It's, it's a little overdone, but again, it's a cartoon for pretty much kids. But, um, I think the mark of good animation like this, whether it's something simple like this, or it's Batman the Animated Series, which is critically acclaimed, or something like SpongeBob, is that you can go back and it kind of has a double meaning for parents as well as the kids. So parents can watch it with their kids and they can get something out of it completely different, uh, separate in a way from what the kids are getting out of it, which is always fun. Um, so that's kind of how I, I looked at this and approached this, because now I am no longer a, a young chillin'. Um, sorry, I was having some microphone issues right there. Uh, thank you for bearing with me, everybody. Um, but it was pretty good. It was a fun adaptation, especially for kids. A lot of the plagues were um, not dumbed down, but kind of toned down. Um, in the recounting, but yeah, it starts off with everyone in the living room and Boris and Minka get into a fight about whose um, crystal they're going to use for the Seder and Boris's family's um, crystal and glassware is supposed to be smudged. And eventually he winds up leaving. Minka thinks that he ran off and ran away and, the whole, and uh, when everybody gets there, they're consoling her that he'll be back. It turns out that he went upstairs to the attic to cool off and then wound up locking himself in, which sort of like die hard led me to believe that this was another situation that would have easily been resolved with cell phones. So this is um, one of those Seinfeld scenes where I feel like most uh, episodes of Seinfeld were based around the fact that people didn't have cell phones, so they were like waiting for something or waiting for someone or going somewhere and someone else was running late. But basically everyone winds up going up into the attic to try to find stuff, and they wind up finding the grandfather. And while they wait for more people to show up to rescue them um, from the attic, quote-unquote rescue, he winds up telling everyone uh, the story of Passover. And everyone's like, wait, what is? Wh why are we here? What is Passover? Because there are several scenes and shots of the Seder dinner as they're reading the booklet and going through the herbs and the horseradish, but nobody really understands why they're doing it or the real meaning behind it, which I think is very interesting. That might be a very pre-internet thing, because nowadays everyone has endless information at their fingertips through um, the internet and it, it, it does seem like it's a um, it's a, a relic that people aren't necessarily curious and don't have the ability to just look something up really quickly but hey who am I to judge so basically they they keep going through it um, he tells the story Tommy is Moses and instead of um, he's let my people go it's always let let my babies go which I thought was really funny um, Angelica is Pharaoh, totally makes sense, um, doing some uh, foreshadowing of gender bending and everything, because she asks uh, Boris, well, can the Pharaoh be, be, be a girl? And he's like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, probably the funniest part of this is when the um, in the Bible, it's the last plague, number 10, the death of the firstborn, when Tommy says, something real, real bad is going to happen. And um, she gets wind that it might be something about the firstborns are going to get taken away, not killed, but just taken away. Um, Angelico pulls out a big 1980s, 1990s style uh, satellite cell phone and calls her dad, who is completely dressed in normal 1990s um, clothes, and asks him just to confirm whether she is an only child. And he's like, of course you are, my sweetie. And she's like, oh, great. Okay, fine. Thanks. Um, so it was fun. It was a really, really good episode. I would definitely advise um, people to go back and watch it, probably if you have the nostalgia for the Rugrats. If you don't have any nostalgia for Rugrats, um, you might not like it. It's a very unique animation style, um, and I forgot how seizure-inducing some of the opening is. Um, but it was good. It was really enjoyable. Um, and I thought that the uh, <laughs> even though the... Um, 
Boris and Minka's uh, Russian accents were, were pretty heavy. I thought they were funny, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so it was, it, it's a great introduction, obviously, for, for children um, into the, the story and the holiday, with especially when if, if you have been watching Rugrats and you're familiar with the characters. Obviously, nowadays, you can just go on YouTube, and there are all kinds of religious um, educational videos put out um, for kids and stuff. Thank you very much for joining us back. Next, I wanted to talk about 2014's Exodus, Gods, and Kings, directed and produced by Ridley Scott. Um, writing credit goes to Adam Cooper, Bill College, Jeffrey Kane, and Stephen Zalian. A uh, lot of people touched that screenplay. Um, starring Christian Bale as Moses, Joel Edgerton as Pharaoh Ramses, John Tuttero, um, who has been absolutely ruined for me since the Transformers movies. I cannot take that man seriously for the life of me. And not only is he super white um, and super out of place in this film, as most of the actors are, I just had a hard time. I mean, I think he does a fine job with what he's given. And it, it's, it's fine. He's actually, if you go in with zero expectations... Um, this is a decent movie, I think, if you're willing to sit through it all um, two hours and change. 150 minutes is the running time, so a little over two hours. Um, John Tudor is fine, but I, he's just been ruined for me since the Transformers movies, uh, which, to be fair, I, I really enjoyed the first Transformers movie. The second and the third were fine if you were fans. Um, otherwise, I don't know. Aaron Paul, surprisingly, is in this. I forgot that he was in this, um, but maybe... I don't know. I thought that when I had first seen this film, I... Um, had already seen Breaking Bad. Maybe I just didn't recognize him because he, he is a somewhat unrecognizable and he does not have many speaking lines. Um, ben Mendelsohn coming in with a uh, sneak as the, um, the, the, I guess he's actually called a vice or he's sort of the administrator of Python, which is the, um, the, the location in the film that all of the um, Hebrew slaves are at and where they're sort of mining um, mining all, all the rock and the stone and everything. Uh, Sigourney Weaver and Ben Kingsley both make appearances in this film. I have to believe that Sigourney Weaver was Ridley Scott said, listen, I, can I just, I just come on, we're friends. Uh, he was just going to do her a solid and give her some bit part as um, John Tuttero as um, the... Uh, head pharaoh at, at the beginning of the film um, uh, John Tuttero's dad that he was like I'll just do you a solid give you a paycheck because she only has one scene where she speaks and for the first 30 minutes of the film she's in scenes and she doesn't say anything and she eventually says something eventually but um, Ben Kingsley as well somebody else to put on the poster I think but Ben Kingsley in typical fashion uh, ever since Gandhi is completely and absolutely wasted. Uh, but I guess that's, no offense, sort of his M.O. these days. He was in Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, and was yet again completely wasted. He was fine. He, he, he did a great job in this film, and I actually think he did a great job in um, Prince of Persia as well, but completely and utterly wasted Ben Kingsley. Um, the definition textbook example of someone who peaked way too early is Ben Kingsley. But... I actually did enjoy this film. So, I mean, again, this is just the basic um, uh, Exodus, uh, Hebrews fleeing Egypt story. It has some twists and turns. Um, there was a lot of uh, talk about it in the media because Ridley Scott is very vocal about being an agnostic and Christian Bale had made some comments that he thought Moses was genocidal and a little crazy based on stuff that happened when they were wandering and the Midianites and um, slaughtering those people. So it was very, very interesting. Um, I, I did watch a little bit of behind the scenes and some interviews, which was fun. Um, Christian Bale is such an interesting guy because he claims, oh, I don't have a, I don't, I don't have a method. I don't have a process for when I act it would make life so much easier. Like Christian Bale, you're 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 batting like a thousand in every movie you do, and you you just come in and you tell me you you got nothing going on, but um he's he's rocking some very serious facial hair in this film and it looks good. Um, the film was released on December twelfth, two thousand fourteen, by Twentieth Century Fox. Interestingly, it is not on Disney Plus, and I think that's part of Disney Plus right now. It feels like it's geared towards children a little bit more. And they don't have a lot of um, classic films on there. 
from 20th Century Fox. I don't know what's going to happen with that. So that'll be interesting to see. I don't know who has the rights and where this all shakes out in um, in the wash. Um, the film was actually banned in some uh, Muslim-majority countries, Egypt, the UAE, um, for historical inaccuracies, quote-unquote, because remember, folks, that um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all share um, the same nexus of belief. Judaism is obviously what Christians consider the Old Testament. Um, Christianity is Judaism plus Jesus as the Messiah who was promised, um, the, the, the prince who was promised, Jon Snow. And Islam is uh, Jesus plus Muhammad. So uh, don't forget that, people, because we are all uh, one and the same. We are all brothers and sisters on this earth, and we should all treat each other with respect. So shout out to uh, Love Your Neighbor. But um, the film looks good for the most part. The first 20 minutes, there's there's some weird stuff going on in this film where I don't know if they had to do reshoots or it felt like they were kind of tweaking and refining the script as they went along because there are some moments where characters, especially Joel Edgerton's character as, as Ramses, um, as, as Pharaoh, he, there's, his, his character doesn't feel consistent throughout the whole film, and he definitely goes through some character developments that don't necessarily make sense. And his character is kind of all over the place with motivations. Um, but the first 20 minutes are so, 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 so dark. They are so dark. Like, to me, just a little washed out. The color correction, way too cool on those tones. Lots of blue tones. And um, it's just very difficult to watch. And that is through the introduction of the characters, the introduction of Memphis and Egypt. And then there's a battle with um um i'm completely blanking right now i apologize people um there is a battle with the hittite army um that are apparently um encamped outside of the memphis greater metropolitan area so after that when they come back there's definitely a dramatic shift in the color correction and the tone and i'm not sure if that's done on purpose um, I know, forgive me because I'm not an actual um, scholar of religious studies, but it definitely feels like they took some liberties and maybe filled in some gaps where things make a bit more sense. Um, the story just starts with Moses and um, Ramses being basically brothers. Um, Moses, everybody knows, is adopted. Um, uh, no, no, I guess that's not true. They they say that he, um, I believe it's Ram. Uh, John Tuttero's supposed to be um, sister, so I guess he's technically um, John uh, Joel Edgerton's bro uh, cousin in the film, but that's not really important. Um, what's important is that Christian Bale's Moses is very considered uh, unreligious. There's a scene with a priestess in the beginning, and she's divining goose intestines and bladders for the upcoming battle, and Christian Bale just laughs and shrugs it off and thinks it's all very, very stupid. And that's where she divines a prophecy about um, Christian Bale saving Joel Edgerton on the battlefield and then that he would someday rule. Joel Edgerton gets a little bummed about this. Um, and then later on in the film, there's the scene where after he gets married and um, he's living with his wife, he... Um, there's the nine years that go by, and his son obviously is born, and he's shepherding and hanging out with his son outside. And his wife kind of confronts him and says, "Can you like stop trying to tell him that uh, my my religion, uh, my my Abrahamic religion doesn't make sense and isn't real, and that he's allowed to choose on his own, and we're just going to raise him in my culture?" Christian Bale's like, "Is it wrong to have him believe in himself?" And she's like, "No, but he he can still like just 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 chill, my man." So overall, I, I, I like it. It does get a little wandering. It feels like Joel Edgerton is making some very interesting decisions. Um, I, I like some of the sol small, subtle movements that he makes. He really puts a lot of feeling into um, Pharaoh, the, the character. He's kind of, there's, it feels like they're going for a, um, a shtick like Brad Pitt in Ocean's Eleven where he's always eating because there are, like, maybe half the scenes that he's in, he's, like, eating snacks that kind of make him look um, bumbling. Almost. Not necessarily bumbling, but just kind of out of touch and aloof. He's always, like, eating snacks, um, which is a little weird because it doesn't fully follow through. But I, I, I it does kind of give 
it does kind of round the film out a little bit that there's so much else going on in the background. You kind of see the seams stitching the film together from all these different writers and all the different tonal shifts and really Scott trying to throw it together. Um, which is really, really, really interesting. I, I, I think it's good, and I actually like sometimes um, some films. I know one of the big examples is always The Emperor's New Groove, the Disney animated film that started off as a musical and then wasn't a musical. And I think that's always really fun when you can kind of see it. And that's why I love, this is a side now, a big aside, I um, love behind-the-scenes special features on movies and um, commentaries. And I really have to credit Star Wars for starting the whole trend of that. And Peter Jackson really took it to a whole new level with the Lord of the Rings, Hobbit movies, um, his version, uh, his adaptation of King Kong, which I actually love and I'll be talking about on this show eventually. Um, I think he does a really, really good job of doing behind-the-scenes stuff. And I love filmmaking and just understanding it and how people go about putting these films together and coalescing them into an actual uh, final product. And I think that some films, even if they're not good, even though I, I, th I think this movie is good, people should watch it if, if they have the time and if they have the energy. But um, even films that aren't good, I think if you can see the seams of the film and you can appreciate how it was put together, it gives a whole other aspect to understanding film, um, which is really important. So once Moses is found out and kicked out of Egypt, um, he 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 leaves and his mom and who he thinks are his mom and his sister who is his actual mother uh his, his actual yeah they um they they see him off and there's a sphinx in the background i am not sure whether it's supposed to be the sphinx but he has on this blue i don't know if it's cotton or linen like big big shawl and it's pretty cool and he looks pretty good um i'm i'm i'm, I'm big on jackets and i'm big on shawls so there's a lot of good shawl action in this film. Um, oh, and then obviously the big controversy was that everyone claimed Ridley Scott depicted God as a petulant, whiny 10-year-old kid, a boy. However, it is made clear later in the film when Moses is talking to this boy, he says, I am tired of dealing with a messenger. So Moses does see the burning bush on um, on the mountain. Um, I apologize. I, it's Mount Horeb, Horeb, I think. Um, Moses does see the burning bush, and then um, this kid appears. And, I mean, I, I've never really gotten a clear answer about this, but it is my understanding that pretty much no one can see the actual face of God because your head would explode and your brain would melt sort of like at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark so anytime someone is talking to God it's either the angel of the Lord which is supposed to be a stand-in or it's some type of messenger like in this case so I would consider this 10 year old boy to be Ridley Scott's interpretation of the angel of the Lord it's definitely not Gabriel the messenger angel who um, would be depicted as such, I think, or would have been identified as such. And also, even in uh, Exodus, even in the book um, and the, the, the Torah, I don't think it's supposed to be Gabriel. When Mary is visited, it is definitely by Gabriel, and Muhammad is visited by Gabriel in the Quran. Those, that's very pretty explicit. But in this, it's just the angel of the Lord, which um, makes sense. Also, there's... Is it Deuteronomy or Numbers? I know there's a spot where God says something to Moses like, yeah, you, you can't look at my face because you would you would explode, but um, I'm going to cover your eyes and I'm going to walk past these, these two mountains and you can look at my back because you can look at my back and your brain will not melt, so you can get that done. So I don't mind. It's a stylistic choice. It kind of goes along with the theme of this might actually all be in Moses' head. I know Ridley Scott was big on trying to find scientific real-world explanations for a lot of these plagues. So, like, Moses is trying to chase these goats up his mountain, and then he gets hit by a mudslide and gets hit in the head, and then he has this vision initially, and this is after he was gotten to a mini-argument with his wife about the religion and their son and what to raise their son. So there's some question as to whether he's having these visions of a kid who looks like his son based on that, um, whether he's actually just schizophrenic. And Ridley Scott sort of, but doesn't really commit to the idea 
of the plagues just being natural phenomena because there is, of course, a military montage of them um, being guerrilla warfare, and they sort of burn and blow up all of these like wine and wheat stores on the river, which then once the plagues start, I guess you could say that some of these wetlands were blown up, which disrupted the crocodiles, which went and messed up these fishermen, and the crocodiles killed a lot of people and a lot of the fish, and then the river flowed with blood, and then the fish were um, floating to the top. So that's the start of water turning to blood is the crocodiles wind up killing a lot of fishermen and a lot of other animals. And then because the frogs that typically live in the Nile um, did not have, they, 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 they couldn't stay in the water because the water was blood, they came out. And then the frogs were on the land, but the frog, frogs couldn't eat enough food and they all died. And then you had the flies and the gnats that came to eat the um to eat the dead frogs, um, and that led to um, pestilence of life. A lot of the livestock died because there wasn't enough food. There were flies everywhere. There were maggots. It was gross. Um, a lot of that led to the boils as well from the flies and all this nasty stuff being around. Um, but then Ridley Scott kind of just abandons it and kind of gives up halfway through, because the thunderstorm of hail, I mean, he just says, oh, it's kind of random. It's just a random thunderstorm of hail. And I'm like, well, you kind of already went this far with the everything having cause and effect, cause and effect. Now where this comes from. The locusts, again, pretty random. There's no reason for them to come in. Darkness, pretty random. Death of the firstborn, completely gave up. Very, very divine. It doesn't make any sense. But then Ridley Scott goes back because as... They are trying to cross the Red Sea. Moses takes a different path through the mountains, thinking that Pharaoh won't be able to chase him. He gets to the Red Sea, and he realizes there's no way we can cross here. Like when I crossed way back when, there's no low tide. There are no straits. I completely effed up. Um, he sees a comet come down, and I believe Ridley Scott's explanation is that this comet or this meteor um, impacted, and the impact... Uh, caused a tsunami and a tidal wave that um, drained the water out of the Red Sea long enough for uh, Moses and everyone to cross, and that's that. So he he kind of gave up halfway with the plagues, but then went back into it for that one, which is fine. It's enjoyable. Um, there are many times when Christian Bale is trying to look at God and trying to ask him to come and talk to him, and God refuses to, which um, seems to make sense. I mean... I don't know, schizophrenia, however you want to do it. So I enjoyed it. It was fine. I'm a big sucker for big um, epic films, big sword and sandal or sword and shield, however you want to call it. I love Gladiator. I love Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, stuff like this. Um, it's it's just fun to me. I mean, I, I like his historical settings, like antiquity like this. Um, I actually did watch gods of egypt um which was terrible terrible but i was really big into egyptology when i was a kid so i just like the aesthetics of ancient egypt and this movie really does a great job with depicting i think memphis and ancient egypt especially the pyramids and when john tutero's character dies and he's wrapped up in mu and mummified there's just so much else going on in the background that it's so so good and ben kingsley and christian bale really really sport some excellent beards in this film. So I have not seen The Prince of Egypt, which is the 1998 animated film that everyone always raves about from my generation, but that might have to be on part two with the Ten Commandments and the Simpsons Bible stories. So thank you for tuning in this week, and enjoy yourselves as always. And as a reminder, happy Passover.